it is sometimes poorly understood. This includes understanding what motivates research, how research methods are developed, and the actual scientific process, when a claim put forth by an article can be trusted, and so on. Using the COVID-19 pandemic as a case study presents a unique opportunity to discuss the many aspects of research and how it affects our lives and the, soci and the societies we live in. In order to make this event as interesting and as useful as possible, we need you, the audience, to submit questions. The link to the form for uh, question submission can be found in the description box wherever you are streaming. The panel for today's discussion consists of Sulalit Bonupadhai, Nina Kristiansen, and Jon Arne Røttingen. Camilla Stoltenberg was listed as a participant. She could unfortunately not make it today. Before each panelist presents themselves and their viewpoints, I will give a quick introduction to each of them. We will begin with Sulalit Bonupadhai. Suralit is a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Chemical Engineering. His research has, amongst other things, focused on the development and use of functionalized magnetic nanoparticles. He was part of the leading, a part of leading the team of researchers that worked to develop the Norwegian COVID-19 test, letting the Norwegian government ramp up testing capacity in April. Suralit, we are excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Christopher, for introducing me. So uh, I am working mostly as a researcher in uh, the Department of Chemical Engineering here at uh, Norwegian University of Science and Technology. And uh, I would like to introduce a bit the background of my uh, research before I bring you to uh, our work with the COVID-19 diagnostic test. So as a researcher, I focus on two main areas at the university and also closely working with industries. One area is within particle engineering and that is where the COVID-19 uh, diagnostic test comes in. And the other research area is looking at how can we use hydrometallurgy, the broad field to recover valuable materials and metals from waste streams, including uh, a lot of work on lithium battery recycling. So quickly to touch upon what we do in our uh, daily research life is I work with uh, making smart nanoparticles and I call them smart because they can do more than one function together. And here we look at uh, making these particles in our research group in order to cater to a wide variety of applications with focus from biomedicine, uh, of which the COVID-19 is a part of, but also more answering more fundamental questions on how these particles grow. In addition to that, with our uh, several international and national projects running, we cater to topics such as how reactions can run faster, how can we treat and manage uh, water resources, and also look at several oil-based applications. The other aspect of research in a, in a very short uh, overview is that we take these electric car batteries, uh, since Norway has also a very high focus on electric cars and uh, we are producing a lot of waste. So these are then processed uh, using different physical and chemical routes to form uh, solutions, colorful solutions, as you see on the screen now and uh, we recover some of these essential elements. And another aspect is that I work in a very uh, interdisciplinary and uh, multicultural group here at uh, NTNU. This is the current group that I am leading here at uh, NTNU with different people from different countries speaking different languages, but all united by the same uh, research vision. So then quickly to kind of set the stage also for today's discussion, I thought that I would present a, a short video about what we have been doing at NTNU the last year regarding uh, COVID-19 diagnostic test. One of the reasons for which and due to this COVID-19, this event is being held online. So uh, I will play a short uh, video uh, and I will then uh, pick up after the video, which shows how this test works. So in a, in a traditional process, we have 
uh, the sample taken through the uh, swab. Uh, and then this SARS virus is broken up in a, in, in a lysis buffer, as you will soon see. So what this buffer does to the virus is then it opens its uh, envelope and exposes the genetic material. And this is an RNA virus. And then comes in our contribution to the test, which is addition of these tiny, tiny magnetic nanoparticles, which then bind to the RNA. And then we apply a magnetic field, which then pulls all these particles together. And now remember the RNA is already bound to them. And we follow a washing step where these RNA is then left out from the magnetic bead. So we release the RNA once again in another uh, solvent. And then this goes for a PCR analysis, which is a standard test and gives us an answer whether the detected virus is coronavirus. So this is what we have been working on uh, the last year. And uh, this has been in a very interdisciplinary uh, team. As I now show you, we have been two departments at NTNU, the university, one department at chemical engineering, where I have been leading the team, as you can see, with uh, of almost 30 people and the other department at uh, Clinical and Molecular Medicine, uh, where Professor Magna Buras has been leading his team. So they, were de de they have developed the lysis buffer, and we have developed the magnetic beads in this process. And to help this process reach out to several uh, people, not only within Norway, but outside Norway, for example, in uh, Denmark and in India and in Brazil, there has been a technology transfer team at the uh, university helping in both patenting and commercialization of this test kit. And I think that is where I'm going to stop for the time being. And uh, I look forward to having a very engaging discussion this evening. Thank you so much. That was very interesting. Next up is Nina Kristiansen. She is the editor in chief at forskning.no and regular writer for the Aftenposten series Uviten. Nina Kristiansen is a journalist and has worked in science communication for the majority of her career. At the beginning of the pandemic, she wrote in Uviten about the many dangers and pitfalls resulting from the extremely high pace at which research was being conducted about COVID-19. Nina, the floor is yours. Uh, sorry, Nina, I believe you're muted. Nina, I think you're muted. Okay, now you can hear me. Yes. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, science journalism in the pandemic. And this is first thing I know, we, we are an online uh, newspaper uh, and we write about everything within science all fields, uh, any subject um, in Norwegian and international science. And uh, we also have an English channel, which is called Science Norway, for those of you who don't read Norwegian. And uh, there we write about Norwegian science to an international audience. And um, in January 2020, because we have to start there, we, uh, of course, since we are science journalists, we follow the um, uh, coronavirus in uh, China. So we wrote an article already in January, how dangerous is the new Chinese coronavirus? And we started early on reporting on the first studies that came out of uh, China or and on the Chinese situation. 
And then uh, Norway closed down in March and uh, we were faced with a dilemma because in the pandemic, it has been a very fast pace when it comes to studies coming out on the virus. And uh, a lot of normal procedures were dropped in science, like uh, peer reviews and publishing in journals. And uh, things were just uploaded to different databases or uh, pu uh, published in, in the magazines without having been uh, peer reviewed. And also very soon, there was a huge amount of studies. So as journalists, we had to decide what is the most important study to uh, cover today. And of course, the, the, the scientists could not really help us because they were trying to orient themselves uh, in this huge amount of studies also. And also there came out a lot of small studies with poor quality. And uh, normally it's not the journalists who uh, decide what is good science or not, because we follow in a way the, the quality process of science, like what is uh, being published and what has, uh, has it been peer reviewed. And um, uh, we, were, we were faced with a new dilemma where we had to look at the studies and decide whether we should write about them or not. And also, as a good journalist, you have to ask, is there room now for critical journalism? Because in most um, crises, uh, the journalists take a step back. Uh, we don't want to scare the population and we are a bit careful in the beginning, maybe for just some hours, maybe for weeks, depending on what type of crisis uh, it is, go is going on. Then we wrote this in uh, March 13. How, uh, this is how long the coronavirus survives in, on the, uh, in the air on plastic, metal and cardboard. And that article was, was read by 500,000 Norwegians. And we were uh, in a bit of a shock. Uh, we understood that people were desperate for reliable information and we have uh, trust in the, the uh, population. So people came to us to read, uh, you know, quality information about um, uh, science in this new situation. And uh, that gave us even more responsibility. So we had to check. What we normally do is the study published and where. I mean, is it a good journal? Is it uh, if it's not published in a journal and the normal procedure, where is has it been published? And who has done the research? Is it big pharma? Is it one uh, scientist somewhere, or is it um, where do they work? What is their standing? And what methods method have they used? Uh, is it a laboratory story? A laboratory study? Is it done on people, is it done on rats? And also, which is quite new for us, what reactions did it get? Since we could not use peer review so much, we had to check the discussion among scientists about the studies that went on. And they and, and scientists were discussing new studies in social media, on Twitter, and all over the place. So we tried to follow those discussions also. So what we do is that we we emphasize the limitations in the studies. If we, we had to write about small studies because everything was so new uh, and there was very, uh, especially in the beginning, there hadn't been time for big studies. But if we wrote about the small studies, we emphasized the limitations. Like five corona patients recovered after receiving blood, blood plasma from healthy people. It is not, you know, we emphasize right in the headline that this is a small study and of course in the text also. So we emphasize the limitations of the studies. And then also we went in depth on a lot of things. For example, when the vaccine came out and there was a lot of talk about, you know, how it has to be kept, you know, one of them had to be frozen. Uh, we kept very high, te low temperatures and the others did not. So, and there was RNA uh, technology. So we went in depth, you know, we wrote about maybe what mainstream media has uh, a little bit more difficult in writing about. Also, as I said, we wanted that critical perspective because we are journalists and we are supposed to be critical towards uh, everybody actually, our sources, our authorities, big pharma, those with money, you know, power. 
And so I wrote an article saying that the health authorities don't know what they are doing, but neither is anyone else. I mean, so what can we do? We have to march uh, together, you know, in order to beat this. But I mean, we are. This is not based on hard science. A lot of it, since the virus is new. And also, uh, we. Uh, this is one story that I think we let go because uh, during the spring of 2020 and into the summer, we watched television and we saw that the whole world were wearing face masks, but uh, we were given the scientific advice that we should not wear face masks, that there was little evidence, scientific evidence, that they would work. And this, uh, there was especially one uh, study that was mentioned, which was um, that uh, we, if you wear face mask, mask, you will touch your face, and that will kind of, uh, you will contaminate uh, your face and everything. So it's, it's no use. And I think we should have criticized the scientific uh, advice more and uh, that the Norwegian Institute of Public Health came up with. I think we should have gone into that science and, and, and looked at that study because nobody mentions that study anymore from the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. But this is the dilemma in a way. I mean, we have to be, you have, we have to trust the scientists and we have to trust them authorities in a time of crisis. On the same time, we want updated information and new studies. And one of my criticisms towards the Public Health Institute and towards the authorities is that I wish they could sum up more and say, we trusted this science before and these studies, and now there has been more knowledge and more information, and maybe we have re-evaluated you know, our advice based on, on uh, new studies. And I wish they could, I, I don't think that weakens the trust in the public, that the public will trust them. So just to end this, our strategy is to report the new studies. We do in-depth coverage. We debunk bad science and conspiracy theories because I think that's important too. I think it's also important to write about dis disagreements and conflicts in science because the population has to learn that, you know, scientists do not always agree and that is okay. That is part of the scientific uh, procedures. And then and also we're going to follow the science after the pandemic. So that was my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. That was also very interesting. Looking forward to discuss uh, a lot of the things you brought up there. The third speaker, Jon Arne Rettingen, currently holds the position of Global Health Ambassador for the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where he works to, amongst other things, coordinate the Norwegian global effort to prevent the spread of COVID-19, including distribution of the vaccines to all countries, independent of their ability to pay. He has previously held the position as CEO of the Norwegian Research, uh, Norwegian Research Council and has worked as a special advisor to the WHO. Jon Arne, please take the virtual stage. Thanks so much, and and great to be <coughs> sorry, great to be here together with you. And and in a way, it's a good mix of uh, Sulalit as a, as a researcher and really doing the research, and and Nina as a science communicator and and communicating research to both the public um, and and in a way to 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 the wider uh, yeah audience as well. Uh, I'm thinking of policymakers, and I my background then is I will probably speak from is. Uh, partly being a research funder and partly having been work, uh, working in the Public Health Institute before and also on translating uh, science to policy. So just briefly on myself, I'm a medical doctor, a uh, scientist. Um, uh, I have a background in sort of basic biology and science as well as infectious disease epidemiology. I've been working on assessing research evidence, so in a way what we call secondary research, so doing synthesis of what research demonstrates and, and then communicating that to practitioners in the healthcare system, uh, so doctors and nurses, as well as providing sort of a, a knowledge base and evidence base for policy making. And then I used to be head of the infection control and vaccination programs at the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. But my most recent role, and I will probably speak more on that, is from the Research Council. Uh, but I was also given my background involved in actually part of the international research response, if we can call it that way, um, during the pandemic. I, I am still leading the what is called the World Health Organization Solidarity Trial. Um, and I'm also chairing 
a, a trial coordination board of clinical trials in Europe uh, across uh, European countries. Um, uh, and also now chair of what we developed as a, what we call the Norwegian knowledge program on COVID-19 or a research or evidence program, uh, trying to better coordinate the activities of all the research actors in Norway. Um, currently I'm in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, and there I'm in particular now uh, working on the global response uh, and in particular uh, to ensure that we can get global access to the tools and technologies that we are developing, vaccines, diagnostic tests, like mentioned by Sulalit, uh, as well as treatments uh, and across the world. Uh, that is called the Access to COVID-19 Tool Accelerator, where Norway co-leads the initiative together with South Africa. But back really to, to the main issues. Uh, I, I think my main message is actually that the research and science, the science community has delivered very well on COVID-19. Uh, and I, I must be, in, in a way, being a representative of that community, I, I think we should be all proud. Uh, but still, there are some important policy learnings, uh, research policy learnings. I think we should try to uh, distill and, and learn and translate them to a policy roadmap uh, on how we operate in the next pandemic or next epidemic or next crisis. Um, I will uh, not focus that much on what individual research funders did in each country, uh, uh, but what we can do more together collectively across countries, because the research and science community is really international. Uh, and I think researchers actually see less uh, uh, boundaries and, and borders than, than most other uh, disciplines in society, which is great. And I think actually, we have seen much more international collaboration and, and international collaborative attitude among researchers than we have seen by policymakers. And, and in particular, early on in the epidemic, there were a lot of uh, what we in sort of uh, clear terms could call protectionist action in the sense of trying to make sure that you can uh, get access to uh, yeah, PPEs, uh, personal product, protective equipment and other necessary commodities. And of course, that's understandable, but we also know that these uh, policy actions uh, in the long run uh, actually undermines uh, what we want to achieve together. Um, what then from the international perspective, I think uh, research organizations and research funding organizations, though, should have worked better together. Uh, we have a platform for coordination called GLOPID R, uh, an acronym, uh, but it's the Global Initiative for Infectious Disease Research that was really set up to coordinate uh, infectious disease crisis rel uh, related research uh, in a crisis and, and should respond uh, just in 24 to 48 hours. It took too long. Uh, it has been a good platform for sharing what research funders did when it comes to uh, issuing calls, uh, uh, rapid calls for proposals, but still there were a lot of double labor and we could have done more together. Then uh, on the positive side, WHO actually stepped up through its R&D blueprint mechanism um, and set clear priorities that could guide both researchers and research funders across countries. And I think that worked well and it gave a good framework for what I think is the most important uh, success, and that is the strong bottom-up motivation uh, by researchers to, to actually work on solving real problems. And I think Sulalit's case here is, is just an excellent example. Uh, I, I'm sure Sulalit was not funded particularly to actually do this, uh, but this was something uh, that the research group saw that they could contribute to through collaboration, cross-disciplinary, and actually do real-time research, uh, I'm sure, out of normal working hours uh, and, and actually partly on the free, their free time. So I think we should uh, applaud what I, I call like a 24-7 attitude by individual researchers uh, and how they really have worked together. I also believe we should applaud what we have seen uh, as uh, more open access to research uh, outputs, uh, more sharing, uh, more open science approaches, uh, also sharing during uh, the research process. Uh, and I, even though I acknowledge these sort of downsides of the preprints and, and the early sharing of results just after research is completed, uh, I think it's uh, it's many more positive effects of preprints uh, sharing than 
negative effects. And I think actually it's not uh, a bad thing that the, the, the society at large understands that research is about uncertainty. It is debate and discussions in research and there can be methodological problems. Uh, and I think we also should acknowledge that uh, peer review uh, is just a part of the overall quality assurance process in research and can often fail and can often, often just delay actually what uh, could otherwise be shared early. So I, I'm actually a believer of a more open peer review system uh, and actually uh, believing that we could uh, share results earlier, uh, have a debate uh, and a systematic peer review, but at the same time also make that open and transparent uh, before, of course, some editors could say and conclude that we have solid uh, research presented. So I think I will leave it with that as an introduction. Uh, and But as I said, I, I think we, as a research community, have achieved a lot uh, during COVID-19. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lana, and thank you again to uh, all of you. Um, this concludes the introductions, so we will now move on to the more general discussion. I want to remind the audience that there is a link in the description box where you can submit your questions. This discussion can only be made better with your participation. I would, however, like to point out that this discussion will focus on science and society, not about specific policy decisions. Um, I want to start off the questioning uh, with a question to you, Solit. Uh, when you first started looking into the use of functionalized nanoparticles, COVID-19 wasn't really a thing. Now, uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe your original intent was for the use in, for example, more targeted drug cancer delivery and things like that. When the need for the COVID-19 test came along, how long, how did you make that link? How did you realize that the technology you had developed for this other area could be used in this situation? That is a very nice uh, discussion and whatever uh, the other panelists have been speaking about. So I think the we have been using these magnetic nanoparticles for a wide range of applications before, not only within biomedicine, but also for tracking how rivers flow uh, and uh, how the groundwater system works. We use the same kind of nanoparticles. Uh, my own background has been uh, utilizing these in uh, biomedicine for uh, for now uh, almost 10 years in that direction. But what was interesting is how the whole thing started. So we were mostly, uh, we became a part of the process, as uh, Yon Arne also mentioned, that the research team started to collaborate across disciplines. So it, it was uh, March uh, 12th when uh, Norway went into a complete lockdown. And uh, after a week almost, around 20th of March, there came in a shortage of these uh, test kits uh, at the St. Olav's Hospital, which is a local hospital here in uh, Trondheim in Norway. And they approached the university if there is possibility of getting some, some kits made. And the interesting part was that uh, we got involved almost uh, three days after they found out that if we are talking about high throughput testing, if you're talking about testing uh, thousands of people within a short period of time, uh, the, the tests that were then being used were without these magnetic particles. So they saw that there was an immense need for using magnetic particles. And the email was sent out to all different groups, research groups at NTNU, and we were one of the first ones to respond uh, to that call. And the journey started. So we had a recipe uh, with us and we didn't know at that point if this would make it for the COVID-19 test. We didn't, I, 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 when I reflect back now, I don't think that we dreamt so big as it uh, happened within a few weeks. What we wanted to do is we, we sent some of our uh, samples that we had from other projects. We made some of them, gave it to the uh, Department of uh, Clinical and Molecular Medicine, uh, I'll call it ICOM, and then they started testing it. And the tests were run very closely with St. Olav's Hospital over the weekend. So that was a time, the free time, let's call it, the time we felt very useful at that point to do something for society without knowing if those particles would actually work because honestly speaking, we have never tried them. So that was how it started. And we soon got to see that it started to work. 
Uh, within days, uh, there were high throughput tests being run, results were being validated, and we started to remind ourselves we are working with a healthcare product, with something that requires validation, uh, requires a lot of time to kind of get it into testing and uh, take decisions based on those tests. So we felt, as I said, very useful, very much for the society. And we were doing out of our research passion, trying to use these, these magnetic particles for a completely different application. Very interesting. Um, so obviously, when developing a test like this, it's, it's easy to see why it's useful. It's, it's very evident, it's right there. A lot of the research uh, being done around, uh, around the world has less immediate applicability. To what degree do you think there's a link between research that is done simply out of a need for uh, scratching a curious itch uh, and then innovation on the other side that ends up having a real impact on, so on society? Uh, so let's... Yes. And uh, that's, uh, that's again connecting back to the main uh, topic what we're discussing is how does science and society interact uh, one of these is this innovation. And uh, uh, throughout uh, the last year, we have been discussing on different forums and trying to reflect on what is innovation? Because we, we often see innovation as, uh, or I used to see personally, innovation as a very abstract term because I didn't know what innovation actually means. But for, for, for the COVID-19 test, uh, this is an innovative product. This is an innovative product in a crisis situation. Now, when I reflect back, if this was a fundamental research which we were doing, to, as you said, the curious edge, which all researchers, all scientists have to expand the knowledge uh, gap in different fields, uh, we would have been uh, making these particles at least for three, four, or even longer before testing it out on an application. That's because we are often not uh, directing our fundamental research to an applied science and especially for uh, things that will help society. But in this case, that option was not there. The option was that we needed to make a product. So the, the thought process became from a process to a product. So the process, nobody cared at that point. When I, I was on the phone with uh, St. Olaf's Hospital and with ICOM people, what they wanted is that, do you have a bead that can work? So we needed a product in, in, a, in a two to three days or at most in a week, and that had to be tested. So for me, uh, what I've learned over uh, this experience is that innovation uh, can also come uh, out of necessity, uh, which probably is something we don't uh, discuss so much within, within science. We always think that it would be, I used to think, okay, one fine day, I'll get an exciting idea. I'll go into the labs and make something and change the world, but that's not innovation. Innovation is actually looking at the same thing, or as I feel now, is looking at the same thing you do on a regular basis uh, in the labs or at your workplace, but trying to apply that in, 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 a, in a broader context, in which case, in this case, which was the COVID-19 test method. Very interesting. Um, so you bring up how innovation in this case happened out of an, an immediate need for, for necessity. Uh, um, other times, innovation takes time. Technological development happens over many years or many decades even. Uh, the idea of creating immunity and immune response, for example, by exposing the immune system to viral material has been, along for a very long uh, has been around for a very long time. But there's a very big difference between the inactivated viruses that were used in vaccines uh, back in, say, the 50s, uh, and the modern vaccines that have been developed to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. I was wondering, Ilana, is it possible for you to give a brief uh, sort of uh, description of how we got technologically from uh, the vaccines of the 50s uh, to where we are today? Well, yeah, that's, uh, that's a long story. but. Um... Maybe to link it to Sulalit's point, because I think uh, it, it's uh, it's not sort of an either or approach to innovation. I, I think um, it, we need uh, different pathways in many ways to actually 
apply knowledge for solving societal challenges or societal problems. Um, I think the engineering and probably as well also the medical sort of and or yeah any any professional schools and any, anyone with a professional school background uh, being being a teacher being a, a technologist being an uh, yeah uh, a, a medical doctor will will sort of start with a problem and and try to build on your uh, knowledge base and of course the knowledge base of of uh, that has been created by science. Uh, to, to find solutions and, and that is sort of a quick pathway. Um, if we had done that sort of based on the scientific knowledge base we had in the 50s when it comes to um, sort of developing new vaccines, uh, we would not have, we have we'd not gone far. We, we would not been able to develop mRNA vaccines. We would not been able to develop recombinant viral vaccines uh, today. So of course that mode of innovation depends on the long-term investment in the knowledge base and in the sort of scientific understanding. So the understanding of immunology just expanded uh, tremendously so in, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, yeah, and even of course continues to, to expand. And all that detailed knowledge of understanding how antigen is presented to by antigen presenting cells to the different cells in the immune system how the immune response is sort of modeled uh, both with cellular immunity and, and so-called humoral immunity, so the antibodies. You need that kind of understanding to actually create these much more modern vaccines. Uh, and that then again, you have the recombinant technology where you needed breakthrough, uh, uh, breakthroughs in, in molecular biology to actually get where we are today. And then combining all of this in sort of new innovations. Uh, so my point is that a lot of innovation is driven by trying to find solutions, but they will be very dependent on where you are in this sort of uh, time of knowledge creation and the overall science base. And we need, therefore, to also invest in that general science base to, to be able to quickly react in, in, a, in a specific situation. Um, so I guess, I, I guess that's the most uh, it, it, it would, would be difficult to go into the specifics of, of individual vaccines, but, but I think the vaccines we have today and, for instance, the, the mRNA vaccines, where they're, they're, they have been nominated now, I think, for the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, th those who really started working on mRNA. Uh, it's a lot of chemistry, it's a lot of biochemistry, uh, the, how, to, how to have mRNA as stable molecules and all of that. It's, it's uh, many many pieces to a large puzzle uh, to actually get where we are today. This uh, leads me very nicely into my next question, and it's about the development of the, amongst other things, the mRNA vaccines that were approved um, back at the very end of December, or beginning of January. Uh, these vaccines were developed at a record pace, at least compared to vaccines that have been uh, developed previously. Um, how is this possible? What did they, did they, were the researchers taking shortcuts or was there something else? How was it possible to develop something like that so quickly? Uh, so it's to me, yeah. uh, I, I, uh, I wouldn't ca call it shortcuts. I think it's, it's demonstrates that you can actually do things a much more quicker than do you normally do if you put resources to it. And resources are money, it's uh, personnel, uh, but it's also collaborative efforts. Uh, so uh, there were huge investments uh, early on uh, in a lot of different vaccine candidates. Now I think the World Health Organization probably have a database of almost 250 different vaccines uh, for COVID-19. Um, and then the, my point of collaboration is that instead of sort of doing a bit of your research, applying for mon more money to continue that research, which takes uh, a year or so. Uh, and, and, and that could happen when you get public funding or it can happen even in, in a company. You, your project is sort of assessed after you deliver to a, uh, a milestone and then, then you may be sort of be able to proceed. This, this was all very different now. Now um, there were uh, the different processes started in parallel. Uh, they developed the candidates at, at the same time they made uh, them ready to go into animal studies. Um, they did uh, the, 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 what is normally done after 
uh, animal studies for immunogenicity, they started to actually validate whether the, there were any uh, safety issues in animal models as well. Um, and then they moved into uh, the first clinical trials in humans. Uh, and instead of doing that sequentially, they already planned for large scale phase three trials, uh, which is the ones that really test whether the vaccines work already when they were doing uh, the phase one trials. And then in addition, we, uh, we started uh, preparing for large scale manufacturing, uh, more or less at the time the vaccines were still in phase one trials. And of course, all of this meant a lot of investment because a lot of these are very risky investments. And, and here there was a collaboration between companies as well as uh, governments who, and, and governments first and foremost, took the risks. They, they guaranteed the procurement of vaccines irrespective of whether the vaccines would work. Uh, um, and then the authorities, the medical, the medicines authorities, they uh, worked very quickly on, on approving both the startup of clinical trials as well as uh, assessment of products. So I, I think it, this just demonstrates that our systems can work much more, um, much faster if we really put efforts to it. And that's time, resources, money, uh, human capital. Um, and and there were, I, I would say there is no um, shortcuts. So there's no issues related to safety. And, and we would more or less have the same evidence base for other vaccines, um, uh, but maybe in general after six to seven to eight years uh, than we now have after a year. Right. So uh, very, very interesting. I'd like to, you speak a lot about uh, collaboration, both you and Sudalit uh, discussed the importance of the collaborative effort. Uh, I'd like to get back to this a little later. First, I want to bring in Nina. Um, um, and I want to talk a little bit about science communication. Uh, a lot of people hear about this, quote, experimental vaccine, and they're worried about, uh, about uh, the side effects that it might potentially have. How does the scientific community break through some of the noise that's out there and, and, and explain how this vaccine works and kind of get across the fact that it is in fact safe uh, to the more general population, those that don't necessarily have a scientific background? Well, we could have just taped you, Marna, and he explained how this process, why the process was faster. And I think that that has not come well enough, well enough out in the public uh, that the procedures and the mechanism among, you know, why why it went so much faster. So um, yeah, we 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 could have been better at explaining that, and the health authorities could have been better. Because there is a certain, I mean, in Norway, there is not much vaccine skepticism, but I mean, in the world there is. And I think that information, information, information. And I just want to take a step back because when we're talking about innovations in science, as a journalist, we have to be a bit careful about that because when there is a lot of innovations going on. We get a lot of press releases and, 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 and emails from, from researchers who have done things that they want us to write about and it's innovations and it will come to the greater good and it will cure diseases or new technology. And very often, we, I mean, we have to be careful because sometimes the researchers brag. I mean, they just want to tell how great they are. Sometimes they want more funding. Sometimes it hasn't really been tested, but they, they think, they, I mean, they're very satisfied with how far they have come. So we have to be a bit careful. And also with the vaccines and in the COVID-19, people put a lot of hope into to early results. Like for example, the malaria medicine and that study in from Italy, you know, that showed that uh, that was uh, not really good, but the whole world and including the American president just kind of jumped on the results and, and put it into practice. So, I mean, we have to be careful and on the same time report on the news and the, that is a difficult balance. But uh, information, information, information is what is needed. How it is done, what is the technology behind it? What is the medicine? What is the, what is the risks, you know? What is the, what is the difference be, be, now than before? And uh, yeah, and trust the public. That is our motto. Right. So, uh, but how do you take 
how do you take that science, which uh, in a lot of cases can be very, very complicated um, mm. and break it down in a way that is actually understandable for someone that's not an expert in specifically RNA chemistry, for example? Well, that, that is why journalism is an um, education and a craft, you know, I mean, this is what journalism is. You, you take, and that is, is not very different from science to political journalism or, you know, I mean, you have to, resp I mean, we work for the readers. We don't work for the scientists. We don't work for the authorities. We work for our readers and we respect our readers and we trust our readers and we write for them. So and uh, we have to make it precise but simple, which is difficult but possible. And uh, sometimes we don't do it well enough uh, and we have a lot of readers, so they will tell us. And uh, we, um, we, we, we measure also with our audiences. I mean, how, how our articles are understood to make sure that we explain very difficult science and in an understandable way and it's possible but it takes work thank you you know you have a comment here no, no i just wanted to say that um sci scientists of course they are competing uh in a way for competing to to uh, in the in the battle of ideas in many uh, ways and and that's why in, individual scientists they want to sell their ideas to to nina and and other journalists uh, um, because they, they one they believe what they've done is great uh, and that is that's that should definitely that's good that's a, uh, they they should be strong believers in their own work and they should be advocates for own, of their own work because others are not uh, necessarily i think we also see more of research institutions actually um paying uh, more um attention to um uh, branding their own institution uh, based on the the good work of their individual scientists like Sulalit. At least if I, I was the boss of NTNU, I would have used your research uh, uh, very much as, as a way of demonstrating how my university uh, really have helped and actually are both great when it comes to science, but also great when it comes to innovation. So I think, and I think that's just natural. And I don't think we should sort of say that that's uh, not happening, but I think then it's even more important the kind of role that Nina uh, and her team does that that they we are actually have critical journalism on on uh, the the, the so-called facts that are presented by by researchers uh, i think it's much more complex than this interplay between research evidence research findings and uh, and and our communication and i think the old day where we sort of the professor were the oracle and and sort of told the the public this is uh, this is the evidence this is the research and and then uh, had no one who contested him because it was normally a, a he in, in those times. I, I think that's uh, very different today. So I think we need critical journalists and I think we need a critical scientific discourse with, with mechanisms for critiquing each other and mechanisms for also synthesizing uh, in robust ways what is the totality of research showing. And I think the most excellent way we are doing this collectively internationally today is the uh, IPPC, the, the International uh, Clim Climate uh, Panel, uh, because that is solid research done on research and to try to demonstrate the totality of research evidence um, for policymakers. Uh, uh, thank you. Nina, you have your hand raised as well. Nina, are you there? You unmuted. I lowered my hand, but I forgot to unmute me. Yeah, we can use Sulalit's innovation as an example of how we should be worked because NTNU was very proud of you, and the communication department was very enthusiastic about your innovation, and it sounded great, you know. But um, uh, on the same time, we have to be careful. So, uh, uh, what we uh, uh, and also in that time, especially. In in the spring and the summer, a lot of researchers want to be in on the pandemic. It sounds crazy, but I mean, it was everything from uh, people, I mean, literature professors to uh, sociologists. I mean, everybody wanted to have to say something about the pandemic. 
And then we heard about this innovation and then we got a really nice piece from the uh, communication department. So what do we do? I mean, is this, uh, is this one of those who wants to just to be in or is it really a great innovation that happened in Trondheim with a new type of test? So what do we do? Well, we call other researchers to try to find out because I mean, we have, we have to use other sources. And it was confirmed that this is really something that's working and it's really great and it can mean a lot. And then we do our piece. So we do have to check our, I mean, that's what we do. We check with other sources who are really enthusiastic also. So, so that is how we work. Uh, thank you. I have a question from one of the uh, audience, Gida Bjerke from Norway. Uh, she says she needs help in discussions uh, relating specifically to the vaccine. Uh, and she's asking, what is a good response to someone who is skeptical about the COVID-19 vaccine uh, due to a shortage of peer-reviewed articles? How does she try to explain to the people she's discussing with that the vaccine is in fact safe? What's the best approach for her? Uh, I, I think we can start with uh, you, Nina. Um, I think that we have to respect the skepticism first of all and uh, that it, it, it has been an abnormal time and people have you know uh, had a lot of consequences on their everyday life and so on and here we have a new medicine and um, it has been developed very fast and people don't understand the technology behind it so we have to respect that skepticism and um, then explain, and I think the most important thing we can do is to start years before the pandemic and explain to people uh, science methodology, you know, that we don't only talk about the results, the results, the results, as we used to do 10, 15 years ago, go in science journalism, but with that we also explain the methods in the study and we write about disagreements and, and, and different perspectives and so on. So people understand the scientific method more. And it could, can be difficult when it has to do with nanoparticles sometimes, but we still have to do it. Then, uh, and then uh, just take the discussion and then do the, uh, do the journalism and the communication work. And, but if it is uh, a skepticism based on that Bill Gates is uh, funding the United Nations in order to make us all infertile. I mean, I'm talking about the conspiracy theory. I don't know what to do because I think that's very difficult. If they're far gone, I don't know. Uh, okay, so in other words, um, don't engage with the uh, far right, cons or not the far right, but the sort of the hardcore conspiracy theorists and, uh, and try to sort of meet the the rest of them with an understanding that people are a little bit skeptical right yes absolutely okay thank you i'd like to oh yeah i see Ilmarna and Sralit both have their hands uh, raised um my screen cut out for a while so i don't know who raised your hand uh, their hand first but uh Sralit 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 first you. yeah okay no I, I was just uh, trying to connect it a bit back to what nina was saying that and also to this question which was kind of came in at the right moment so uh, my point is as follows, that we are talking about uh, validating or verifying if the research or this, the skepticism about research, which is also there, let's say a part of uh, critical journalism, as I understand. But also all researchers have a responsibility. A and this is something that we probably also need to brand a bit more. Uh, and there is a lot of work, at, I know that going on in funding agencies about responsible research uh, coming in, what kind of uh, impact that has on the work that you want to do and want to show the world. So I, 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 find, I very much uh, think that there is a need for uh, making this aware among researchers, their responsibility, not only towards doing uh, science the way they want it, but at the same time, their responsibility towards innovating new thing for society. So that is a that, that may be a soft corner to touch on uh, when we are explaining things about vaccines, uh, even to people who are skeptical in the initial phase to talk about, give examples of researchers and show that this has 
this has worked this has helped and you wanna no th those are great points and and that's it's about responsible research it's about uh, research uh, research ethics and it's about following sort of sound methods and standards uh, back to the vaccine question and then applying this because um, when when the, the first reports on the effective vaccines came out uh, and that was uh, early november um, uh, those were only re released as press releases, one page from the company uh, that the vaccine uh, had worked. But actually, I um, we, we could be pretty confident uh, that this was actually a very promising and solid result. And the reason is partly because they are adhering to standards on how they evaluate and validate the vaccines. So, so back to Sulalit's point. And we, could, we saw the overall numbers. But still, the message was, of course, that this was preliminary and, and there was no guidance at that time that vaccines should be used. And then uh, before the vaccines have been approved, they, there have been peer-reviewed publications, uh, so reviewed by other researchers. But we should also acknowledge that the medicines authorities, they sit on a lot of data on, on the products uh, and also data that are not published uh, and, and go in detail and look into all the different uh, results uh, of the trials that have been done and, and all the animal studies that have been done. So actually when the, the, um, the medic medicines authorities, uh, so in Europe, it's the European Medicines Agency approves a vaccine. There is a lot of independent assessment that is done. And, and, and I think at that stage, uh, you will have research publications that are peer reviewed, you can show them and you will, will also have this stamp of approval by uh, uh, national uh, and international authorities uh, on the safety and efficacy of a vaccine. So I think if you have a friend who's unsure, I, I think it's actually just demonstrating that process and, and actually telling the, them what, what kind of uh, validation processes they, the vaccines have gone through before coming uh, onto the market. That's really important. Thank you. I want to move a bit back to um, the topic of collaboration. Um, and uh, Solerit, uh, we'll begin with you here as well. Uh, you spoke in your introduction a bit about how your team was a very diverse team. Um, you also spoke about how you got going on this project through an email that was sent out to all of the um, academic groups at Antonu, but I'm, I'm wondering more in general, given that research spans a lot of borders, uh, spans international borders, and and you, uh, you end up working with people that you don't necessarily already know from before. How, in research, do you find collaborators? Like, how does that typically happen? Well, uh, a starting point is probably uh, when you, if you are in a research group uh, or working with your supervisor, PhD supervisor, you, you generally get connected to a certain network. Whether you would like to be in that network in the long run, or you want to create your own network of researchers is, is very much dependent on the person. It varies from one to another. Uh, I mean, the easiest way that people find uh, good collaborations is probably through, again, research communication. So I can tell that many of the people uh, I currently collaborate with are through very good research articles or that I have read about them in, in, uh, in some, uh, some popular research communication as well, popular science communication. But other than that, I think uh, th this was a unique way of collaboration that started. I mean, in NTNU, uh, we have been working with these particles for biomedicine for a large, uh, for a long time now, but after this COVID-19, the interest in the work, the interest in having collaboration within NTNU has uh, gone really high. But this was not there before, although we, we, we work in, I mean, maybe just in the next building with people really looking for such nanoparticles for their own uh, research have not been collaborating or we haven't had the opportunity to collaborate. Why? Partly because I think that every researcher is or is in this academic bubble. Uh, they like to think in their own way. They like to, and that's also academic freedom, let's say, to, to do things. But what is becoming more and more important in these, especially in crisis times, but also if you look at the 
maybe Yona or Nick can come in later if this is a correct observation, is that people are more trying to look at collaborating and developing these networks uh, on, on uh, defined problems. So for which the climate panel was one example, let's say, where there is a, there is a definite problem at hand but also in local uh, research environments, this is becoming uh, more realistic. So from professors having their own groups and having a very strong ideology about certain things, how this should work and how they shouldn't work, uh, maybe this is still the case in different parts of the world and would be for many years, fortunately or unfortunately. But we are, we are seeing that uh, there are more people looking at uh, establishing research areas and collaborating with three, four different disciplines. Uh, and what uh, Yonarne said in his introduction is that what this crisis has shown us, that there has been a lot of international collaboration uh, during this, which may not necessarily be for COVID, but the fact that people got used to using digital media as we are doing now uh, and saying that, okay, we can invite a Nobel laureate and have a, uh, have an, a session just without doing any other uh, expenses, let's say, no travel costs. People have cut down on budget so much, no travel almost uh, when it comes to conference. I'm not saying that that is good or bad right now, but what I'm saying is that it has shown a completely new dimension of collaborating. That previously people were, or at least us co communicating to world leaders in some, some fields, we would hesitate. But the COVID-19 situation has given us a new way of thinking, a new way of collaborating actually, and setting up networks, which we probably would have not done if uh, travel was not a restriction. Then we would go to some conferences, specific areas, uh, discuss with them, but now it's kind of, the world has become even more closer. Uh, Johanne, do you want to comment on this? Um... No, I, I, I fully agree with Sula here that, uh... And um, in a way, th these are the indirect effects in many ways of the pandemic. Uh, and I was also thinking of the digital sort of platforms and, and the digital age as, as a great facilitator for, for international collaboration. And I think the lack of travel and the need to actually you know, just get used to what we do now, uh, to have direct conversations in, in virtual meetings, has made and uh, has reduced the barriers. Um, I'm I'm getting old, but but uh, uh, when I started my medical training in uh, yeah late uh, 80s, uh, um, very actually I I were among the few students who had email account actually before we started because I had done some other work before. Um, the World Wide Web was quite still quite young, uh, and this this is just 30 years, and and in sort of in the history of science, of course that's a very brief period. But if you see the explosion of digitalization, and now with this latest turn on using video conferences, which I think is has the technology was there, but we just there were many cultural and so, social barriers in a way to use them. I think that will have an important impact, and tremendous impact on how we work and operate. And I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I will not speak about a lot about what I do now, but actually, I see it even in diplomacy. Um, I'm, I'm doing a lot of international work now, trying to mobilize governments together, collaborate, find solutions, consult on what we're doing, discuss methods uh, on, on how we distribute financial sort of contributions to, to common, uh, uh, common solutions. And uh, I can what I do now in a couple of days, I would probably have used a couple of weeks to do before because I, I would have needed to go to London, I would need to go to Brussels, to Berlin, to New York, to, to, to Washington, because the tra tradition was that that kind of sensitive discussion and Paris, uh, indeed, uh, and those have been more difficult to be honest. Uh, th those, the tradition has been that you, you should meet in person, these are difficult discussions, we should sit down, we should uh, spend some time, get to know each other, of course, and that's important, we shouldn't lose that, but I think uh, we have become much more efficient, uh, and I think research and research collaboration, reducing barriers, contact Nobel Prize laureates, the, the, you, you don't get a yes without asking, uh, and, and, and it's no worry to get a no, because you can have a yes next time, so I, I think that's, that's great, and I think uh, 
uh, I, I'm very optimistic actually on the digitalization of research. Uh, we will have more sharing of data, more sharing of what we do uh, as we move forward. Uh, and and uh, I don't think we have fully reflected on, on how that will impact our uh, lives. Very interesting. Nina, a quick comment and then we need to move on in the discussion. Yeah, I was. If we're now talking about the, uh, you know, the the advantages with having a, had a pandemic, also the people's interest in science. You know, we. I mean, we we got a very good question about skepticism to vaccine. But I was in a Zoom meeting with some friends who have no medical background, and 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 we were discussing what which of the vaccines we would prefer. And people have really, you know, I mean. They know stuff about the different vaccines and the, you know, that one you have to take twice and da da da. And those are the disadvantages and the technology behind it. And I was really impressed because people are interested and people are interested in viruses and in in in, in different ways of protecting yourself against getting contaminated. And we can learn from that when we have the next flu, you know. And people are interested in science and in, in health and in, in, and, in, and in vaccines. Ask any person who had taken a vaccine before, it, you know, what is in it and they would have no idea. And now people know. So, I mean, that is one advantage also. Um, would you say that a silver lining of the pandemic has been that uh, the scientific literacy amongst the general population has increased as a result? At least on this area, yeah. Maybe not on nanoparticles, but on you know viruses and, and the vaccines, yes, absolutely. Uh, a quick comment from you, Yonarna, and then we need to start talking about uh, policy. Yeah, no, uh, I just wanted to say that we actually have evidence on this because uh, the Research Council has sort of measured the trust in science and in a sort of a population uh, poll uh, regularly. And we saw an increase in the trust in science uh, from sort of early or late 2019 through the, the spring of 2020. And I think that that is really just related to the fact what uh, Nina is saying. We, 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 every individual in Norway they needed more information, more knowledge. The, the journalists started writing about this. We have a, a lot of new science journalists, in a way, that have trained mm -hmm. themselves during the pandemic, at least in this specific field of, of research. Uh, and I think just more um, information on science and knowledge, or uh, yeah, research-based knowledge in, in media has increased the trust, which mm -hmm. is very positive because it indicates mm -hmm. that we can actually work on this by, by having a bit more emphasis on, on science uh, communication uh, in general media and in, and in special media like the forskning.no or other sources. Uh, thank you. So uh, now to move a bit on, move the discussion forwards a little bit, I wanna start talking about uh, the interaction between science and policy. And I wanna start off with uh, research funding because uh, we like to think of academia is free, you know, you can research whatever you want and you find interesting. But at the end of the day, the researchers also need to get paid. Now, Ilana, you were the CEO of the Norwegian Research Council and the main job of the Norwegian Research Council is to allocate funds for research on behalf of the Norwegian government. I guess what I'm asking is this, how do you choose what research to fund? What metrics do you use? Is it political in any way? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, and 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 uh, all in a way, all funding is actually political in a way uh, because there is always choices being made on how you how you allocate resources. It's a choice whether you allocate it directly to institutions uh, or whether you uh, allocate it through a national competition uh, that sort of a research funding organization like the Research Council is. Uh, and then you allocate it through a national competition. Uh, it's a question of how do you do that? How do you organize the competition? If you, if you organize it uh, uh, in, in a way where you more or less invite all scientists to, to come with the best ideas, irrespective of the field of science or, uh, or thematic area, um, you did, that's, that's a choice. And I think that's a way to make sure that we have this solid knowledge base across all fields. And we need a, a clear proportion of that kind of research funding. But then, um, there is, and, and, but that will only sort of um, uh, continue in a way the balance between different disciplines, the different areas that is already there because it's, it's the researchers that are in the, in, in the universities uh, 
and and the numbers more or less that in average over time will then decide uh, the profile in a way of that research and then i think it is fair for society to have some strategic sort of views on where we need more knowledge maybe we need more more emphasis on ICT, for instance, more so more more computer science for a period, uh, more art, or artificial intelligence could could be one topic. Uh, we, um, we we need more focus on new uh, sustainable solutions. It could be uh, clean energy uh, solutions, and I think it's fair for politicians to to sort of set those strategic areas. But of course, then we also have competition among those areas. And the good thing about such calls are that they actually invite for often cross collaborate uh, cross disciplinary collaborations to actually uh, respond to some of those calls um, so i think that balance between strategies that are in some way uh, rooted in political decisions and and also the strategy of having open uh, calls where anyone can apply based on uh, irrespective of field is important what i have said in addition is that a crisis may even uh, indicate that we need uh, a, a third way of funding research, and that is uh, even a more managed directive approach and actually setting priorities much faster, saying that we need to solve this and this uh, solution. The testing example is good. Uh, that was done locally, which is fantastic uh, that uh, an institution could do that, or two institutions in, the, in a way, the hospital and the, and the university. Um, but you in a way the world should be able to set such priorities and say that we need we need, need new vaccines we need new, new therapies and we want specific sort of uh, collaborative projects to to solve those challenges so that's the third mode where you actually call more specifically to solve specific uh, problems very interesting so that's the funding part of it the other part of uh, research and society and research and policy is uh, when science attempts to influence uh, political decisions uh, so in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic that would be things like the WHO advising countries to shut down or uh, in Norway specifically it would be FOE advising some you know specific regulation or or, or whatever uh, is science inherently political in that context uh Yolanda? Uh, no, I wouldn't say science is political, uh, but it's science in, is contextual, and it, of course, it has it is partly built on what is sort of uh, prioritized. So, in, in in one way, you can say the the agenda setting that has been done in the past will, of course, have an impact on the science being done. But my, I, I, I think I should say that science, though, should be independent. Uh, it should not set. It should not be prescriptive of, of uh, political decisions. Uh, I think it should inform political decisions, uh, but it should be open what is known and what is not known. Scientists can be asked to come recommendations, but then they should be clear on where the science stop and where their sort of judge, judgments and value uh, assessment uh, is starting. Um, and then in the end, uh, Political decisions are are should are and should be done by politicians, uh, and uh, and they of course should also be transparent and on what sort of additional sort of considerations they have made um, uh, when when making the decisions. I think the, the specifics of this pandemic demonstrates there was a lot of uncertainty. So there, even the science could only provide some, and then there were many sort of scenarios and, and different potential uh, sort of next steps op options and and that of course left even more room for for politicians to make decisions and i think in general uh, politicians then in an in a crisis will tend to be a bit risk averse and and tend to make sure that we do enough uh, to control for instance a, a situation which is probably a, a good bias in a sense of at least being on the safe side when it comes to the, the control measures. So there are a lot of questions coming in. Uh, I want to get to them. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give Sulalit and Nina a very quick word, and then I'm going to address some of the questions that have uh, come in here. So Sulalit. Yeah, uh, to, the, to the discussion around whether science is uh, political or not, I mean, I agree to what Yonane said that it is not. But what I would like to also kind of urge uh, that scientists often try to 
stay away from politics, uh, which is often not, a, I mean, not to do politics, but to have a good uh, relationship with decision makers or policy makers is very important because unless and uh, until you come up with you under, first of all, you need to understand what you are doing, which most researchers know in their own field. Then you need to see your research in a bit broader context. What can it do, whether it's for society uh, in, in, at large or for a specific part? But at the third time, you need to make a move. You need to make yourself aware. One is, of course, through research communication. But I believe that it's not at all, uh, I mean, it, is, it would be more appreciated if more and more scientists would also be able to explain their science to politicians better. So not, not take on political politicians or take on the role of politicians and decision making or policy making, but explain their science better. And that, that is closely linked with communication of, of what you are doing. Nina, uh, quickly before I give you the word, I just want to uh, read you the title of an article you wrote, and maybe you could comment on that as well. Um, the title of the article was, This is how politicians abuse research. Is mm. this a common problem? Yeah, it's absolutely a common problem because what politicians do is that they cherry pick the studies that work for them and their politics, you know. So we have seen that a lot of times that we have been quoted by politicians, but they just take out, you know, the part that they or the one study or the part of the article that they, they seem fit. So uh, and and it's an interesting um, thing in society that you, you, if you want to argue something, whether it is politics, whether it is road or whether it is health or whether it is school, you have to base your arguments on studies and science. So you, you cannot just, you know, have an argument. You have to, you know, ground it in something. And then that is where science comes in. And it's uh, and of course, it is abused. But um, I wanted to say to what you and Arne said that uh, I think that uh, the Norwegian Institute of Public Health has done a wonderful job in the pandemic with advising the government. But I think that sometimes they should have um, emphasized more that they are this, they are working with the scientific advice and that they are not making the decision, like you and Arne said. And and for example, the example that I showed with the masks. I mean, uh, in the whole world were wearing face masks and uh, the scientific advice to us, the Norwegian public, was that they don't work. And now they work because now we use them also. But the fact was also that Norway didn't have any face masks in, in, in March, April. There was none. I mean, there was none in storage. So I have wondered, you know, how pragmatic was the Institute of, of Public Health in giving that scientific advice. Was it politics or was it science? I don't know, and I'm questioning that. And I think that they should have left it more to the, to the politicians to, to uh, I mean, emphasize more that it is the politicians who make the, the, the policy and that uh, the science behind some of the advice is not uh, certain. I wish they had done more of that. Thank you. I think that concludes that uh, very specific uh, discussion. Uh, I do need to address some of the questions from the audience at this point. Um, the first one is from Johannes. He asks a question specifically to you, Yulnarna. He says, as COVID-19 vaccination has begun on a large scale in several Western and or rich countries, there has been quite a lot of backlash claiming that these countries have bought too much vaccines, too many vaccines for themselves and not worked hard enough to ensure the fair distribution of vaccines. What he is wondering is whether or not the huge amount of vaccines bought and paid for early by Western countries accelerated the research and production of vaccines and thus made the vaccinations available for the entire world more quickly overall. Well, I think I think that's quite quite a fair description, uh, and there is there is a lot of misunderstanding on these sort of statistics saying that Canada bought six times as many vaccines they needed. Europe, including Norway, have have bought four times as many vaccines we needed, because we we need to understand that the the contracts made or at least the 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 MOUs or the early decisions on on the which vaccines and how many vaccines um, 
to, to buy were made uh, last summer, uh, long before we had any evidence on uh, which vaccines would work. Uh, and at that stage, my assessment would be that one of five vaccines would only work uh, because that's the general number if you go back in history on how many vaccines that are entering into clinical trials that are actually approved. Uh, now, uh, and uh, more vaccines, it may be four or five vaccines that were, were in clinical trials early, it seemed to actually be successful and work. And then you have the situation, you will have oversubscription in a way. Um, and I believe we then, of course, should make sure that those vaccines are shared and, and quickly can be distributed to other parts of the world that were not in the position to to enter into these uh, very expensive and, and, and risk-based contracts early. So definitely the early decision to contract many different vaccine companies uh, based on risks have been contributing to faster development, faster clinical trials, and therefore faster vaccine access to everyone. But at the same time, I think it is, is important to understand that we still should do more uh, from a solidaric and sort of altruistic perspective uh, and a moral perspective to make sure that we can vaccinate all over the world. And that means we need more funding. And it's actually not only an altruistic argument because it's very sound economic studies uh, have documented that uh, there would be tremendous impact on our economies in Norway, in other high income countries, if we do not control the pandemic more quickly by making sure that everyone can be safe, irrespective of where you live. Um, so there are very, very solid arguments. I don't think we have better investment case in economic policy than actually doing the right thing and, and, and stopping the pandemic as quickly as possible through science and through the rollout of these technologies in a fair way. Very interesting. I want to now bring up a question posed by Dua Fasihi. Um, he asks, and I'm going to add an extra question to the end of his, because he asks, how much have we navigated the post-COVID complications as they differ significantly from individual to individual? And I'm going to add a question to that, and I'm going to ask, um, how easy is it to conduct that type of study? Like, what would a study like that involve? Uh, anyone who feels like answering, maybe you, Yomarna. No, I think we uh, we definitely need to pay attention to the potential uh, long-term consequences of, of going through COVID-19 infection. Uh, I think the only way to do that is, is robust, quite large population-based studies where we follow individuals for a longer time period. And, and we also try to uh, measure and, and maybe also qualitatively interview people early on uh, to understand what are the potential predictors of those who seem to have sequela or what we call a sort of uh, longer term negative consequences of the infection. But this is very difficult uh, area, definitely. Uh, and I think we need more research into it. Uh, and we need probably also to go back and, and better understand whether they're uh, it's really the infection or whether there are other drivers for the same uh, symptoms. Uh, so it's still uh, a lot of uncertainty in this space, but very important to, to, to be very serious about, absolutely. Nina, you wanted to comment? And I think it's very, very, very important to, to study this very, very early because um, uh, well, the pandemic came around in March and already in April, May, uh, there was news stories about long-term effects of COVID-19. And we did a story on that. And, and it was, medically, you don't talk about long-term effects before after a year. And there were all, I mean, this, 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 this condition already existed in, in, in April. So I think that it's very important to, to study it and to give information about it because people have been afraid and they have had a very dramatic experience maybe with the disease. And it's, it's important to, you know, calm people and say that, you know, it, um, yeah, to find out what this is. So um, we have time for one more question, I think, before we need to round off. There are so many more things I would like to discuss with you, but unfortunately, we are running out of time. This question I want to pose to you, Sulalit. Um, the question is from Donald Ugarte Jr. He asks, what, if any, would you say is the role of scientific institutions to ensure a better understanding of your research 
on the part of the general public. And then uh, uh, you specifically, I mean, you work for a for an institution. Um, so what are your thoughts on your role, the institution's role? How do they kind of mingle? Hmm. Now, I mean, this is very important uh, also since this is the largest university uh, in Norway where we are located. Uh, I think the, the institution has a very important role in, first of all, driving research to strategic uh, areas. And this, as we understand here, develops from, let's say, the research group level to the department level, and then to the uh, faculty as we have it, and then to the central level or to the level where uh, the, the majority of the uh, long-term decision-making towards research strategies are made very jointly with, the, uh, let's say, the government and the research council, since after all, this is a publicly funded university. Uh, I guess uh, it's, uh, I, I have thought about this for a long time, what, I mean, there are ways of recognition in different countries, how things are done, how research is recognized. Uh, there is, of course, uh, publi publications is one thing where people are having a very high focus uh, on that. Uh, the branding of the institution plays a role in there. So it's it's not a it's not an easy uh, one solution to how would you have this research uh, recognized. And then some of these research goes in, let's say, in the form of products. Uh, it comes in affects society. So how do we measure such uh, research is, is always a question one can ask. Thank you. So uh, we are unfortunately at this point, or Nina, did you have a comment? Your hand is uh, raised. No, okay. Uh, we are unfortunately out of time uh, at this point. Uh, as I said, there are so many more things I'd like to discuss. There are more questions here that unfortunately we don't have the time to get into. Um, before we do end, I would like to give all of you the opportunity to give some closing comments, some final thoughts. We will do this in the opposite order of the order we gave the introductions in. So we will begin with you, Yolanda. Uh, I, I don't think I have a final statement other than saying that it's, it's important to reflect on these sort of broader issues uh, in the midst of a, of a crisis where science has really had an important uh, role to play but where we should definitely learn on these uh, questions related to bridging science to policy uh, and also how we collaborate in the scientific community. And, and then of course, the science communication as a part of it. Um, I think we've learned a lot. Uh, I think we can sort of improve our systems based on this learning. Uh, and uh, therefore I'm quite optimistic actually on the role of science in society. Uh, I just saw the other day that Tony Fauci uh, had received sort of a, uh, a prize for his role in sort of defending science. Uh, he, he has sort of transferred from being an advisor to Trump, uh, who was not a science believer into becoming an, a, a chief advisor on, on COVID to the President Biden, who is really branding himself and his team on sort of building the new uh, administration in the US on on police uh, on on science, uh, which is great. Um, so I, I think uh, it it has the pandemic has really demonstrated the value of science, but also understanding that science is not perfect. Science needs critique and discourse. So thanks for the opportunity to be a part of this discussion. And thank you, uh, Nina. Somebody said that the society is only prepared for the uh, previous uh, crisis. So when in Norway, we have been, uh, we were not prepared for our last crisis, you know, the terror attack. And uh, now we were not prepared for the pandemic, uh, but we are now prepared for terror attacks. But um, now we have been through a pandemic and uh, I think we have to learn. And I agree with you, Nani, in everything that he says. And, also within journalism, I mean, we never evaluate anything. We just rush on to the next thing. But I think we have to look at um, a lot of, I mean, how how to balance the thing that to give information and on the same time, we need the trust in society towards science and towards uh, the authorities because they're going to handle the crisis and the scientists are going to give the advice. So how to balance that I mean skeptical and, and critical journalism 
combined with the fact that we all have to march together toward and do the same things in order to beat the, the virus. So, I mean, that is some of the things that we have to discuss in journalistic circles. Thank you. Thank you. Sulalit? Yes, uh, I would like to also uh, stress a bit on the roles that researchers as such we have in, in, uh, in, in connecting and linking science and society. And first of all, we must remember that a researcher uh, has a lot of roles, uh, being a manager, being an employer, being a supervisor, being an academician, being a good planner, uh, getting funds. But what we often forget in that process is that it's very central to give back something to society. And what this pandemic has uh, made, because all research doesn't necessarily, uh, is built out of things that will directly impact society. And being working in such a field which uh, intertwines engineering, science, and medicine is, 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 a, is an advantage for several researchers. And I would like to uh, conclude by saying that the pandemic has taught us actually to be very bold, to take decisions which otherwise might take a long time to arrive at. But of course, we have uh, learned to use new methods to test our own hypothesis. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. This has been a very enlightening discussion for me. I have learned a lot. Uh, I also want to say thank you to the audience for your questions uh, and your help in making this debate as interesting as possible. We also want to thank Studente Schomfen in Trondheim, and more specifically the groups that have been involved uh, in making this event possible, so that would be Video Komiteen, Forsterker Komiteen, Fotogjengen, Reshi, Vertskap and Sikring. Uh, I want to wish uh, all of you a good night and thank you.